Hi. Good morning. Why is it 9 a.m.? No, but seriously, like anything in the games industry should not happen before maybe 11, I think. I don't know. This is terrible. I'm so sorry for getting all of you out here this early morning. Uh, I wish I could have let you sleep for just an extra hour, especially some of the people in the back of the audience who all seem like they're kind of scared to hear sound at the moment. Um, my apologies. Uh, as for the introduction, I am Rami Ismail, that is indeed correct. Um, I am also half of Lambir, which is also correct. We worked on these games, which is also correct. Um, does anybody here not know what Vlambeer is? Just do, like, you can raise your hand if you've got no idea. Good. All right, we've got a few people. So the very basic version is we are a two-man game studio from the Netherlands that was founded in 2010. We started making a bunch of freeware games. Those did really well. Then we decided maybe we can earn money doing this. So we started charging for games. Uh, then we decided we should make a mobile game. That mobile game became wildly successful and is a game about fishing with machine guns. Um, then we made an airplane game with machine guns. And uh, then we made a mutant game with machine guns. Um, there's a lot of machine guns. Uh, I'm still not sure if that's a theme or I should talk to anybody about that, but there are machine guns, lots of them. There's a lot of weapons in Nuclear Throne. Um, we are not just known for our games, though. We're also known for a bunch of other stuff we do. So um, I'm the creator of a whole bunch of stuff, uh, including my own blog. It's kind of a weird addition to the list. But um, I may do press kit, which helps independent developers create press kits. I may do distribute, which helps independent developers distribute their builds to the press. I may do toolkit, which honestly is just a website that lists the other two websites, but I thought it was useful. Uh, it also includes do contract, which is a site that helps you write contracts. And then finally, I'm also working on something called Game Dev World, which is a website that tries to bring knowledge about the games industry to every major language in the world, including Russian and Arabic and Chinese and Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, that one is a work in progress. The bottom one is, is my blog. Um, if you want to read the things I think, you can do that on my blog or on my Twitter. Good. I have a question for you. Who here is a developer? Game developer. Great. Who here is a student at the moment? The majority of you, you, who here is an independent developer or an already established developer? Even you? Are you sure? Okay. Hi, right, good. Um, good. So I want to talk about three things because um, it seems that the audience is mostly students. So I'm going to kind of gear my talk towards them. Uh, a lot of these things are also going to apply to other people in the industry, but they probably have run into this stuff. Uh, basically, I want to talk about these three things. And these are the three things that you should probably learn in school, but probably won't. Uh, that has nothing to do with the school or the quality of the school. Um, this has to do with just the fact that these things are really hard to learn unless you fuck them up. Okay? Um, and unless you've been around for a while, you've probably fucked these up like, you've probably not fucked these up often enough to actually fully understand what they're about. So, I'm going to talk to you about these, and I want to prefix this with, this won't actually teach you these skills. This will teach you to look for these skills and to recognize them when they happen, and to learn from them uh, when you fuck up. So, I also want to be really honest with you all, um, which means that sometimes I can be a bit mean during this presentation. Okay? So, let's do it one more time. Who here is a student? Okay, let's go. Who's working on a game right now? All right, uh, you, orange shirt. Yeah, you. Uh, what are you working on? What is it? No, asking for the title. What is the game? Co-op party game. Is it good? You think so? Why is it good? It's fun. It Made people laugh. Why is it fun? Based. It's crazy physics based. Is yeah. that fun? It is fun. The crazy physics are always fun. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. Who thinks crazy physics are always fun? Always? 
I've seen a lot of really crazy physics bugs, and they're not fun. They usually make me cry. Uh, any, anybody else who's working on a game right now? Who, who were the students again? I suddenly have three students left. Did everybody else just <laughs> everybody else just quit school? Was it? I'm really sorry to the organizers of the event, <laughs> Master Appa. No, who else? Come on. Sure, you seem like you seem like you want to talk. Let's go. What are you working on? Uh, we actually just released a game from the Xbox One called Clash. Cool. Is it fun? Um, it is fun, yes. Why? It is fun because um, it's a game where you sit with your friends, you're about four people in a room, and it creates a really tense experience because you're always close to, to each other and you try and kill each other as, as well. Alright. Does this sound fun? <laughs> you don't have to be scared with giving answers. Don't worry, I'm not going to bite. It's going to be fine. Good. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so I want to start with creative direction and um, as you might have guessed the question that I want to focus on first is why. Why is the question that you probably should be asking yourself most often. Why is a very useful question. It's sort of like a Swiss army knife. It's like whenever you don't really know the answer to something, the question why will usually get you there. So let's, uh, again, Hans, who's making games? Okay, so in the, is it pink? It's kind of pink. Salmon, yeah. Okay, uh, you. Uh, why do you make games? Uh, it gives you creative freedom. It helps you evolve and provide entertainment for others. Why didn't you become a writer? Because writing has never really been my thing. All right. Why not? I'm not sure. Why games? Uh, I've always played games, and I've felt that th the next step to taking that to a profession would be making games, and I've always been kind of analytical about playing games and tr try to figure out why is something good and why is something fun. Okay. Have you figured that out yet? No, but okay. I'm getting there. Anybody else? Somebody? Why are you making games? Who wants to answer that question for me? Pick anybody, really. Just all of the people that are raising their hand. There's so many. <laughs> Nobody knows why they're making games, apparently. Just. Well, I grew up playing games, and uh, something I enjoy a lot. So I wanted to basically give back doing some. Th and I thought the process of making games seemed interesting. Seems interesting, and uh, I feel I both get a lot from making the games as well as seeing what happens when other people play them and okay. seeing their enjoyment. So what do you get out of it? I get the enjoyment out of making something and seeing others get pleasure and enjoyment from that. And hopefully I'll be able to make money from that someday so I can actually survive from that. All right. That seems very solid. Okay. So why is an interesting question? Because why is a, is a question that you can answer yourself over and over again? And every time you ask yourself, it gives a different answer. And it's kind of a shitty thing. I think you all played that game as a kid, probably, where you ask somebody a question and you go, like, why? And they give an answer, and they ask why again. They give another answer, and they ask why again. They give another answer, and then they get annoyed, and eventually the game stops when they either punch you or just leave, right? Um, now, that question is actually really, really useful, and that game is actually surprisingly useful, because it turns out that most of us have no idea why the hell we do what we do. Most of us have no idea why we are making games, and most of us have no idea why we're making the game that we're currently making. Why are, why are you making the current game that you're making? Have you ever thought about that? And if you have thought about that, how many of you had the answer because it's fun? Just raise your hand. Yeah? I'm pretty sure it was more of you. And you're all just sitting there laughing at me, but it was way more. Let's try it again. How many of you, for how many of you, the answer is it's fun? Just be honest, it's not a bad answer. Okay, now the question you should be asking yourself is, why is it fun? Why do I think it's fun? Now that's a way different question, and actually try to answer that, you'll realize that none of you actually have the same answer. It's just the first layer of the answer, the one that you all felt completely comfortable with having, turns out to be a bit too simple, right? So why helps you dig at truth? It helps you dig at things, it helps you understand things, and understanding those things is going to be really, really critical if you want to make a good game. Because as soon as you know what that nugget of truth at the heart of your game is, whether it's a fucking long tongue on a goat or um, a fishing game with machine guns, like 
as soon as you figure out what is at the core of your experience, you can dig at it, and you can build on it, its foundations. But most people never learn that skill. Most people just learn that at some point you just make a bunch of stuff and then one of them is fun and it feels fun and it's nice and then you make that thing. That's a bad idea. Understand why you're going to make that thing. What is special about it? Why, why are you interested in it? Why would anybody else be interested in it, right? So whenever you find yourself at a crossroads, ask yourself why. Whenever you find yourself on a straight path, ask yourself why am I on this path? You can always ask yourself why. And it's always good to just every now and then just sit back, take a step back, look at what is happening and ask why is this happening? And then when you get those answers, who knows, maybe you'll go out of the direction. Okay, so another thing I really want to talk about. So how many of you have teams that are more than one person? How many of you have formed those teams yourself? Okay, so it's your own team. How many of you have programmers that have been late with their work? You all have amazing fucking programmers. That's like high above industry standard. Uh, you've never worked with a programmer that was late on this project? They've never been late on anything? Wow. Congratulations. Um, if they are late, whose fault is that? Yeah, um, the, the answer is the whoever is in charge of production, right? Whoever is leading the scheduling. Yes, the programmer can fuck up, but if the programmer has fucked up, then the producer should probably have an idea on how to fix it, right? So it's not always as one-to-one -one with responsibilities. And one of the most important things you can do in a team is set clear responsibilities. So a lot of you are making a game. How many of you know who the producer on your team is? Okay, who's the pr who are producers? Uh, you, what is your what is your job? Okay, so yeah, okay. So what is your job as a producer? The project is delivered on time. Yeah. Okay. Even even if it costs forty million dollars. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even if the budget is two million dollars. Well. You never mentioned the budget should be a problem. So yeah, it's <laughs> I mean, I never mentioned that it couldn't be. <laughs> That's true. Fair enough. So, your job is to make sure the game gets delivered on time. On time. Yeah, basically. What? And yeah, you could say on budget. <laughs> In budget. Yeah, basically to make sure things go yeah. well. Who has a different definition for producer? Nobody. Okay. Sure. Go. Just give it to somebody with a hand. No, that's wrong. Give it to somebody raising their hand. Uh, so yeah, I think it's uh, as well as the time versus uh, what's in the game versus the budget. What gets cut first, uh, yeah. and what is the highest, um, the the most important prioritizing thing for for the project. Yeah, yeah. prioritizing things in the project. Yeah. Um, that could also be a responsibility. Like the fun part about this whole question is that there's a lot of answers and most of them are kind of right, right? The thing is, not everybody agrees on these things. And it's important to know what your responsibilities are. I don't know if you've ever looked at Flambeer, but Flambeer is a two-man studio, right? We have two people. We have me, we have the other guy. The other guy's name is JW. I'm going to refer to him a number of times during the presentation. The way it's set up is really, really simple. JW is our designer. He's really good at design. He spent a lot of his life making 300 games a year, and every single one of them was shit. And that's how he got really good, because he made a lot of terrible games, and he learned what is a bad game, and how can I recognize that this game is going to be bad? And now he doesn't make those games anymore, and suddenly he makes good games. It's kind of a surprise. Um, my job is not a designer. I Before I went before I started Flambeer with JW, I had worked on four games, of which three were larger commercial products. I'm really good at wrapping up a project. I'm good at keeping it on track. Good at the business. I'm good at the marketing. I'm a programmer too, so I program a lot of our stuff as well. Um, but when we started, the first thing we did is we said, okay, what is your job? What is my job? What does that mean? Right? And very often, that's a bit more complicated than I am the programmer. 
or I am the artist, or I am the producer. Because those things don't mean the same things to every person. They don't have the same responsibilities to every person. So what you need to do when you start is create very, very clear responsibilities for everybody. If in your team, you haven't talked about this, what is my job, what is your job, and if something fucks up, whose fault is that? Then you should probably be talking about that. In our case, it's really, really simple. When something in the game design fucks up, it's JW's fault. If anything else goes wrong, it's my fault. I make a lot of mistakes. I have made a lot of mistakes. I've cost our studio probably hundreds of thousands of dollars through various mistakes. Uh, probably over a million at this point. Huh. Um, wow. Yeah, but um, we make mistakes, right? But the important part is that you can figure out who made the mistake, why the mistake was made, and what you can learn from it. And if you've clear, got clear responsibilities, it's a lot easier. It, whoa, it's a lot. 9 a.m. Geez, it's a lot easier to figure out why the mistake happened, where the mistake happened, and what you can do to avoid the mistake in the future. Now, the other thing I really want to warn you against, especially as students, is flat hierarchy, because that's such a nice buzzword that Valve is using, and a bunch of others. And it sounds amazing, having a flat hierarchy. Nobody is in charge, everybody is on equal footing. Don't do it. You know why not? Because even Valve is having trouble with it. It's not easy. Flat hierarchy is really, really hard. The most experienced people in the industry have a hard time running a flat hierarchy. There's no good reason to assume that we could run a flat hierarchy or that you could run a flat hierarchy. In fact, it's probably a really bad idea. I can tell you stories of about 15 to 20 different independent developers, studios, that I've helped out getting their studio back on track. And the main reason for their studio not working well was because they all had equal hierarchy. They were all in the same spot. The problem with that is, as soon as you've got more than two, maybe three people, it's not easy to get to a consensus. So even studios that made really successful games almost fell apart right after launching that game because they couldn't agree on what was next. So make sure that you've got somebody in charge of something that you can shout at when they do it wrong. Make sure that it's not a situation where everybody has exactly equal say in everything because it'll just get you stuck. Me and JW once had a discussion for three days about the shape of clouds. Not kidding, actually the shape of clouds. In Luftrausser's JW wanted really cool Chinese water painting clouds that look like this, and I thought I wanted clouds that look like clouds. <laughs> we argued for three days. We went home angry on the second day. On the third day, JW almost used his design veto, then decided that he didn't want to do that, and then went, well, I guess I don't want to use my veto, so you sh you're probably right. And then he went with clouds that look like clouds. But that decision was only reached because there was a way to close it, right? There was a way for us to just be like, listen, this conversation is over now. I'm going to make an executive call, and if I'm wrong, it's on me. And he looked at it, and he thought about it, and he realized he was wrong. Because those clouds look a lot like wind, and they're ugly. Um, so that's one of the hundreds of moments in which Flamber could have lost weeks just arguing about tiny things that at this point are just like, we just disagree. But then the person who knows more about it, who got the responsibility, makes the call. We did a giveaway in December, January of last year, where every person that had ever bought Nuclear Throne got a free copy of Nuclear Throne. And JW thought it was a terrible idea. And I said, that's great. I don't give a shit. And then I run a promotion. And then it turned out that I'm I knew what I was doing, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. And then things worked out. But if we hadn't agreed on that, there's no way I could have made that decision in about the week that I had to make that call because we would have argued about it for forever, right? So make sure you've got clear responsibilities and fuck flat hierarchy. Um, so you all said you, you have really good programmers that deliver everything on time, that's great. Uh, you all probably really good at, at this whole process thing, scheduling, stuff like that, no? 
Who here works on a game that takes more than three months to create? Okay, you're all students, like most of you are students. Who's, who's a student working on a game that takes more than three months to create? Is it part of the exercise that it has to be more than three months? No, it's just more than three months. So, why? You, you are in school right now. Like, you have the perfect opportunity to fuck up a hundred thousand different things. Instead, you're going to do one thing, and at the end, you'll be able to evaluate it. And then you'll be able to learn maybe a few things that went wrong, right? When you make a game, how many of you do game jams? Good, good. Fucking love game jams. Um, 48 hours. How many hours is getting to the prototype? Zero. Zero? Zero would be really good. Uh, five. I like five as an answer. Anybody else? Like 40, 47. <laughs> All right. I tend to go with three. I tend to go with three for a really, really simple reason. We found, and we're really fast at making stuff, that if we spend three hours on making a prototype, 48 hours is just enough to get it polished. Because making a game that's fun, making a system that's fun, that's fun to interact with, can be done r relatively fastly. Proven, proving that your concept is interesting can usually be done relatively fast. Now, it depends on the genre you're working on. Some genres are a lot more complex than other genres. But in most cases, you'll be able to get to a core experience in a relatively short amount of time. Now, the longer it takes to get to that point, the longer it's going to take to polish. It's just sort of like an exponential function. If you work on something for three weeks before you can get going, in our case, if we prototype for two weeks, the game production will be two years. We've tested this. It works every single time for us. Um, so you want to make sure that early on you know your game is going to be fun. Whether you do that through paper prototyping, or through making an actual prototype, or through playing it in the fucking yard out there, like, I don't care. But you have to make sure the game is fun very early on. And if possible, you have to make sure the game kind of looks like a game early on. It doesn't have to look exactly like a video game, but if you want to communicate certain information, make sure that gets communicated. Early HUD, early version of the HUD, little impact effects, little animations, little things, just make sure that it has that little bit of feel to it. There's a really cool story that Ronnie Mo once told me, and Ronnie Mo are the creators of Awesome Knots, um, and they had, a, they had a thing in the game where you could jump with your character, and the jump always felt wrong. There was a tiny bit of delay in the jump. They never, realized, they never figured out why that was there and why it was so annoying, until they added a jump animation. And it turned out that the programmer had already taken care of making sure the jump animation was there, but they'd been tweaking for weeks, trying to figure out why that jump didn't feel good, till eventually they realized that it was just programmed in there to have an animation. Nobody added the animation. So you want to make sure that everything already kind of communicates. It doesn't have to communicate perfectly, but make sure that the things that are important to you, if your jump is important, if it's a platformer, make sure your jump feels fucking good, right? If, you're, if your player is going to be walking around most of the time, make sure that walking is fun. If it's a shooting game, make sure shooting is fun. If it's a racing game, make sure sliding around the corner is fun. It's that simple. Get that down as soon as possible. And when you're thinking of ideas, when you're going through ideas, our brain has the amazing tendency to fill in every single fucking detail that we don't have. Now, a great thing about computers is they have no fucking clue how to do that. So your amazing game idea is in your mind, and it will never be on a computer. Never. Whatever is in your mind will never be on a computer because your brain is not a binary device. Your brain fills in every single detail. Your brain is not a computer and whatever works in your brain will not work on a computer. The sooner you realize that, the better it is. You can't make that translation. You can get close, you can get in the right direction, but everybody's had that game idea at some point of like some sort of fucking castle in the clouds with fucking dragons and knights and I don't know what kind of shit. We've all had the idea and it's always bad. It's never been a good game. And it's not been a good game because that's not a game. That's a story. It's not even a story, it's a setting. But we've all had a variation of this idea, just like a little story. In our mind is this amazing grand video game. On a computer it's nothing. And we keep falling for it. 
Because every time we see it and we go, yeah, that could be cool. And then we don't test it. We get going. And then three months in, we're like, actually, there's nothing here. And there goes three months of your life. We also are really good at creating one-offs in our head. Just like things that you have like this big game and then there's this one special moment that's different. That special moment is going to fuck up everything. Don't have that special moment unless you know what, what you're doing. That special moment is going to be a completely separate part of the engine because that's the way that always works. Everybody has like their their free running game with a fucking race mode halfway through or like parachute jump. I don't know. Um, I mean, that's what I would do. Um, everybody creates that one off in their head. That's like the one special moment in your game. If your game itself on its own does not have a special moment, if that is not the special moment, you probably should just be focusing on the special moment that you're trying to create. If that's the good thing, if that's the thing you really want to get across, if you want to make a free running game with a really cool parachuting moment, why don't, ma why don't you make a parachute game? If that's the thing you're excited about. Why not do that? And get your feedback early. Talk to people. Make sure that what you think works actually works instead of it works in your head because you know where you're going. And finally, somebody there early on, I asked them whether they knew the answer to a question and they said no. And that's good. We all want to have the answers. I don't know why that is, but we feel very uncomfortable not knowing. Learn to admit that you don't know. Okay? Just if somebody asks you something and you're not sure, here's the answer. I don't know. Let's figure it out, right? Let's go look. Let's find data. Let's look at examples. Let's read a book. Let's figure it out. So many of us want to have the answers, and so many of us fear we're going to look dumb if we don't have the answers, but we don't. It's our job to not have answers and then procure the answers. That's literally what our job is. Nobody knows exactly how they're going to program something when they start. We just get going. Then we make it better as we go. We call it iteration. Same thing applies to everything we do. It applies to art, applies to design, applies to concepts, applies to everything. Oh, and um, who of you have done that thing where you're working on a project and the deadline is soonish and nobody was fucking finishing your game, so you went and finished it? Nobody? No? I've done that. Um, good for you. Also, don't do that. Um, it's awesome. It's really awesome that you took that responsibility. And it's really shit that your team failed in such a way that somebody had to do that. But don't crunch. If you can avoid it, don't crunch. There's always going to be points where crunch is sort of a thing that happens for a few days. But if your entire project is dependent on one person getting shit done, that's the end of your company right there. Because that person will burn out. That person put in way too hard, put in way too much work to fix the shit of everybody else. And yes, sure, it seems heroic. And yes, maybe it is heroic, but it's also very wrong. And it's creating a dependency in your team, in your process, that people are going to depend on. They're going to be like, well, you know, it might be tight, but we've got that person. They're going to fix it. And it won't work. It won't keep working. Don't do that. If you ever are that person where you're like, I, wanna, I need to fix this alone. I need to sit here and work long hours. Get your team together the next day. Talk about what happened. Talk about how that was bad. And talk about how you can fix it structurally. Not just this one time. How can you avoid this ever? Right? Because in the end, the most important thing we have is motivation. Sure, money is important and knowledge is important, but the, the, the critical thing we have is motivation. If you think of game development as three different things, your motivation, your money, and your knowledge, if you lose one of those three things, right? Let's say you lose the money. You've got no money, but you've got knowledge, and you're motivated. Will you make a video game? Probably. We started Vlambeer with no money. We were school dropouts. We ate noodles, duck noodles, for months. Um, literally for months. Uh, noodles and Coca-Cola. Uh, and that's how we made our first game. And that's how we made our first money. Right? So if you lose the knowledge, and you've got money, you've got motivation, will the game get made? Yeah. 
because you can hire somebody with the knowledge, right? You've got money. Why not? Now, if you've got technology, if you've got knowledge, you've got money, but you don't have motivation, will the game get made? No. Everybody always talks about getting funding. Everybody always talks about learning stuff. If you're not talking about being emotionally well, you're missing the most important thing. You're missing the single most important thing, and you're missing the thing that ultimately will decide whether you'll be able to be a game developer or not, whether you'll be able to sustain a project or not. It's the motivation. It's your emotional well-being. If that is not something that you are talking about, that you are thinking about, start talking about it. Start thinking about it. Start creating a social network of people, a social support structure of people you can talk to if you're not feeling well. Make sure that this is a thing that you can talk about in your team. I'm not feeling well. I need a break. At Vlambeer, ground rule, somebody needs a break, they go on a fucking break. Doesn't matter. If it's the last week before the deadline, if they need a break, they go on a break. I'm the producer, they do that. I tell whoever that the deadline is not going to happen or I make sure that there's somebody else who can catch that work, right? Because if they burn out, it's great. We just launched our game. Also, we just lost a person. And that's not worth it. Now, the final thing, motivation isn't the full answer because we have a tendency to put motivation too high on a pedestal as well. Sometimes you're just not motivated. And that's not a failure. You didn't fuck up. Sometimes you just have to be disciplined. Sometimes this job is shit. You just need to sit down, do the fucking work, go back to bed. Wake up again, do the same thing, go back to bed. Take a day off, go back to bed. Get back to work, go back to bed. Discipline is also important, right? You just Sometimes you just need to sit down and do the work, whether you like it or not, whether you're motivated or not. And the final thing is... Um, is all of this doesn't matter if you can't communicate about it. So again, make sure you can communicate about everything I just mentioned. If those are not subjects that you've talked about in your team, make sure that after this is over, the first thing you do, get your team together, talk about all the stuff I just talked about. And communication is hard. Words are hard. Words are terrible. They're completely useless to communicate 90% of the stuff we want to talk about. I do an exercise with a lot of people where I say a word and then somebody else responds with the first word they think of, right? So if I say the word sun, big ball of lava in the sky, what do you think of? Heat. Moon. Sorry? Destruction. Oh, whoa. Uh, Chris, wake up. Sun, what do you think of? Brightness. Summer. Okay, five different answers. Nobody had the same answer. We all agree it's a bright fucking ball of lava in the sky, but beyond that, we don't agree. Words are completely, completely useless to communicate anything further than the actual word you're using. We all agree that it's a big ball of lava, but we don't agree about anything about that. Do an exercise with my students where I tell them to make a platform or ask me any question. You've got three days to make it. 20 minutes. They can ask me anything. No, if you make the game that I have in mind even close, you pass the test. If not, you fail. Everybody has failed. Nobody has ever done it. Because they start asking me questions. What does the game look like? Well, you know, it's, it's a platformer. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you try to get to the end of the level. How do you get to the end of the level? Walking and jumping. What are the controls? Arrow keys, space bar. How do you defeat enemies? I mean, you jump on them. So there are enemies. Yes, there are enemies. Are there power-ups? Yeah, there's a power-up. What does the power-up do? It helps you grow. Right? What game am I talking about? Super Mario. Super Mario. Everybody makes Super Mario. And then they all... Bring it to me, then I showed on Super Mario like 64. And it's a 3D platformer. Nobody has ever made a 3D platformer. Why not? Because everybody assumes that the word platformer with those answers means 2D Mario. Now, that might seem like I'm being mean, but I've seen projects fail for that exact reason, reason where somebody thought they understood what the assignment was, assumed they understand what the job was, and they were wrong. And it's over. So, words are not the best way of communicating. You know how they could have saved themselves? If somebody was smart enough in those 20 minutes to draw a mock-up and be like, is this what you want? And I would have said no. And they could have been, so what do you want? I would have been, well, that's 2D. It's that simple. If somebody had made a prototype, that would have worked. Words are very inadequate at communicating a lot of things about games.
communicate in the things you want to communicate about. You want to communicate about art? Make a fucking drawing. You want to communicate about a design thing? Make a little prototype. You want to communicate about sound? Make the sound. I talk to my sound designer like, no, I want a little bit less and a little bit more all the time. This is my average conversation with the guy. Like, no, I don't like the can you fix that? And that works, because now we're talking on a level that immediately correlates to what we're working on. Well, if I say I want a little less rumble, little less rumble in that sound, what the fuck does that even mean? Does anybody have any idea? What, like, I don't, I don't even know what that means. I just say it because it would be the best word I had for it, but it could mean com two completely different things. Just like the word sun can mean completely different. To me, you know what sun means? Egypt. I'm Egyptian. It's my holiday. We could agree about the word and not agree about anything else. So use the thing you're trying to communicate about. Stay clear about your goals and milestones. Discuss your obstacles and successes. Discuss your motivation. Discuss your emotional well-being. And make sure that you can communicate about your roles, the responsibilities you're taking, why you're take making those choices, and why you've got those responsibilities. I'm already running out of time. Pitching. Okay. Um, who knows what pitching is? Okay. Who's good at it? Wow. That sucks. It's going to be fun in the games industry if you don't know how to pitch your game. Uh, who's working on a game? Okay, uh, you, you look way too happy about this. You're not, you're not getting it. Uh, one more time. <laughs> who's who's working on a game right now? All right. Um, you black shirt, white logo. Yes. Can you pitch your game three sentences? So it's a third-person adventure platformer, sort of a cross between Crash Bandicoot and Mirror's Edge. Okay, cool. Uh, that sounds really cool. I'd love to look up more about the game. Uh, it's later this day, and I want to look this up. Does anybody know what I should Google for? <laughs> what? What did he say? Oh yeah, Mirror's Edge meets Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, that's going to get me exactly the right answer. I never played Crash Bandicoot. Ugh. I don't think I'm interested in this game. Is Crash Bandicoot a good game? Is it? I th I've heard it's good, but... Uh, it's an adventure platformer. Anybody know what the fuck that means? No? Well, maybe I can look it up under platforms. Was it a mobile game? Oh, we don't know. That's right. Huh. Do we know anything about this game right now? You don't, huh? Okay. Thank you for, thank you for pitching. I'm so sorry. Um, anybody else want to pitch? Anybody? All right, sure. Go for it. You got a little bit of preparation time. Three sentences. Yeah, okay. So we are doing a first-person horror game set in ancient Greece. It's available on PC, and it's called Medusa's Labyrinth. All right. It's a 3D... First-person horror game. First-person horror. Did everybody get that? Does everybody remember that? Yeah. For which platforms? You see? What, what, what was the name? It is Labyrinth. Did everybody remember that? Yeah, does everybody, do all of you know the game through being here? Is that a thing? <laughs> Makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, it was a, already a lot better. I, I, you know the thing that didn't get to me is like, I don't know why I should play this. I've played, I've played Amnesia. That was pretty good. Uh, I don't know why it's different. It's set in Greece. Not sure that's enough to make me interested. Why should I be interested in this? And why is that not part of your pitch, right? Pitching is really, really hard. Now, for all of you that are making a game right now that didn't raise their hand, why the fuck not? You have a you have an opportunity to pitch. No, you raise your hand. Like you're fine. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So why are you not certain what to say? 
You're making a video game. This is important, right? This is a big deal. What if instead of me right here, there was somebody from a giant corporation that said, I have a big bag of money for the best pitch that gets done today. You're like, I don't know what to say. That's not a good idea. And for all of you that didn't know what to say either, you could have tried. Why not? Just shoot. At worst, you'll get feedback. I mean, everybody will grin a little bit, so fucking what? It's better that they grin at you now, and then when you need it, you've got your pitch. You can go for it. Then sit here right now and be scared of the response, and maybe I'll bite. Yeah, I'll bite. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm on the stage, is to bite. To tell you that you can do better. Right? And you can do better. So, I want you to do the following. I want you to figure out a way to tell me or anybody else what your game is, why they should give a shit, and how I can find it. Three sentences. And I want you to be able to rattle that off right away, to just start going, give the pitch, straight face, not a single uh in it. If I throw a fucking bucket of water in your face at like 2 a.m. in the morning, right? I want you to be able to be like, what is your game? And you go, uh, Ridiculous Fishing is a game about fish machine guns for iOS platforms. And I want you to be able to do that. I want you to be able to immediately do that. Not a single stutter. Why not? Because you never know when this is going to be useful. And when it's going to be useful, you're going to wish you were prepared. So make sure you are prepared. Our industry is bad at two things. One is scheduling, and two is scheduling. And that mostly shows itself in scope. Because we think we can do way more than we can. Triple A actually has this down better than we do as independent developers. Because as independent developers, we don't have money shouting at us most of the times. We just have dreams, right? It's like dreams and butterflies. Um, Triple A has evil money overlords, and those actually help a lot. If you don't have evil money overlords, make sure you've got an equivalent. Somebody that can say, hey, listen, we need to scope down. And even if there's no, man no money involved, a lot of people go to the basic basic idea of bigger is better, or even commercial is better. Like, you're a game developer, whether you make a commercial game or not doesn't fucking matter. If you're working on a game, you're a game developer. If you've started a single line of code, you're a game developer, right? If you've thought for a moment about a design and started prototyping it, you're a game developer. Made any piece of game art, you're a game developer. Commercial is not always better. Bigger is not always better. Scope small. One of, the, one of the best tips that I've ever got is every task that you can come up with costs a week to implement. And every subtask in that task, every small divider that you can put in that task, every single part of those also takes a week. And that's weird, but it's true. Whatever task you can come up with will take about a week to implement. And however you subdivide that, every single one of those subtasks will also take a week. So things take longer than we think. Things are unpredictable. We work in a medium that's so infinitely complex that nobody can say what will work, what will not work, what will work fast, what will work bad. I've had bugs that I thought I would chase for months, and I'd fix them by changing a single line of code. I've had bugs that I could fix in a minute, and it took me three months to fix them. Right. That applies to all parts of game development. It applies to art, it applies to audio, it applies to code, everything. Scope small. Scope really, really small. And it also goes for your team. Yesterday I saw uh, that one, uh, the, one of the projects, um, one, uh, one of the student projects won a prize. Um, two of the student projects actually sort of had a winner and a runner-up. Um, congratulations to all of you. That was an enormous team. That was a huge team. If they were to start a company right now, that would be really, really, really hard. Because that is a lot of people. I think I counted eight. Does anybody know? Nine. Nine. Wow. Nine to start a studio? That's going to be really tough. It's going to be really hard. In fact, we were two people. We had a really hard time starting a studio. Because it turns out that every person you add adds a lot of money to what you need to earn to make a sustainable living. It also turns out it adds a lot of tension to a team. When you have more people, you don't manage them well. As soon as you hit like six, seven, eight people, you're probably going to need some sort of management to make sure that they're all communicating well. So now you've got more people. At some point, teams get so big that they need to get bigger to be that big. 
Which sounds ridiculous, but that's absolutely a thing that'll happen. Nice. That was subtle. Um, <laughs> nobody noticed that. Um, if you're if you're gonna start a project, if you're gonna start a project, and this doesn't necessarily apply to the the winning project, if you've got a student project and you've got five people, you got X people. This is gonna sound really mean. Lose one or two. Look at the team and look at why this team functions. Look at who you absolutely need. Look at who you don't need. Look at who's critical to the success of this and look at who's not critical to the success of this. Talk, negotiate, figure out how this is going to work. That's the kind of call that you're going to end up making a lot if you're going to run a studio. Things that suck, choices that suck, choices that are terrible, terrible choices and will make you feel like a bad human being. But the reality is, you could start that company with nine people and you will probably fail. And then nine people don't have a job. Or you could start the project with four people and you might succeed. And four people have a job. Then you can see what you can do for the other five, right? Four of you get success. Maybe you've got a nice deal, a revenue share. Maybe you've got something else going on. Maybe there's a deal for if the studio grows. I don't know. It sounds really mean, but it is the right choice, right? If it wasn't, I probably wouldn't be telling a whole bunch of students this. Um, but team size, it's way too easy to be too big as a student team, and it becomes so much harder as soon as education drops away. So keep your team small. Think about why your team is this big. Talk about, you know, who's critical? Who's here? Who's that one person that everybody kind of has in the team, but do they actually do anything? Why are they not doing anything? Talk about that. And in the same way, your budget, I have to go faster. Um, our budgeting is also really, really bad. What is, uh, what do you think the average cost for running a two man studio like Vlamber is on about a yearly basis? We're just two people. It's a li bit, little best. It's not quite a million. bit less than that still, but good. You all aimed high. I'd rather you aim too high. When we started, you know what we thought the budget was going to be? 30,000 a year. And the honest reality is, for a while, that was true, because we only ate, ne we only ate noodles and Coca-Cola. We drank Coca-Cola, but um, it turns out that running a, a studio with just a few people will quickly ramp up about 200,000 a year just to start with, right? It's just a few people, that's a tiny team. If you start with less money, if you start with less to spend, that's fine. Everybody starts somewhere. But your goal should always be to get to the point where you can pay everybody fairly, where you can pay them the salary that they should get, industry standard or higher. Make that your goal. Make that your very, your very first most important goal as a studio when you start is how do I get to the point where everybody earns a fair wage? And then, sure, that'll lead to sub-goals. How do I release my first game? How do I release my first good game? But that should be your goal. Your first long-term goal is, how do I get to the point where everybody earns the money that they should get? And when it comes to goals, you've got long-term goals, you've got short-term goals. I don't want you to care about mid-term goals. That's bullshit. The whole idea of mid-term goals is bullshit. I want you to take something that is so far out there as a goal that you have no idea how you're going to reach it. For us, it was how can we launch a game on every single platform that we care about. We wanted to launch an Xbox, wanted to launch on PlayStation, wanted to launch on mobile, wanted to launch on PC, Mac, Linux, we wanted to launch on everything, and we wanted to be able to do that when we wanted to. And it seemed impossible. And five years later, we're here, right? The trick to that was we set that goal, but we didn't shoot for it. What we shot for was a way smaller goal. We shot for something that's nearby, something that's just out of reach just like right there, right? That's what we aim for. That's how you do this. You figure out where you want to go, then you take small steps. If you're going to take the big shot, like, I don't know if you've ever like worked on anything that has to fire projectiles, but if, you, if you're going to build your first cannon, you're not going to aim for an apple on somebody's head, right? That's not the first shot you take. That's effectively what you're doing if you go for the big one straight away. Don't go for the big one straight away. Take small steps. 
increment, iterate, keep going. Same way you would make a video game, apply that to your business. Not don't take risks, because you're taking risks, you're starting a company, that's what a company is, it's taking risk. But don't do that thing where the first game you make is your World of Warcraft defeating MMORPG for all platforms with sandbox physics, right? Don't do that. Don't be that person. Also, don't be aimless. Make sure you always have goals. If you have goals, you have a direction. If you don't have direction, you won't know where to go. Goals help you answer the question of why. Why am I doing this? Where am I trying to go? So challenge yourself to something. And finally, all of that stuff is important because it helps you position what you're doing somewhere in the industry. So who here is pretty up to date of the industry? Who here read the thing about uh, Kickstarter fining a company $54,000? Here has thought of using Kickstarter for the project at some point. Why are those not the same people? If you're going to use Kickstarter, why are you not up to date on what the hell is happening with Kickstarter? If you're in the games industry, why are you not up to date of what is happening with Kickstarter? That was a major headline article on Gamma Sutra just two days ago. You all should have read that. Because this is our industry. Shit's happening, it's changing, stuff's changing fast. How do you know what's relevant? How do you know what to focus on? How do you know what the trends are in our industry? If you're not up to date on our little, literally our industry website, that could be your start, like that should be your homepage probably. Just read on what is happening. What is happening? Where, where should I, like what should I be focusing on? What should I be doing? What are other people doing? How can I not do that? How can I do into something else than what everybody else is doing? Or how can I get better at the things that people are looking for right now? Part of this industry is that it's always changing. And it's changing fast. It's changing so fast. Everything that was true just a year ago is no longer true today. You should be up to date of that. Everything that you learn here in school, and nothing against school, everything that you learn here in school is going to be two or three years old by the time you're done. Because everything you learned in your first grade is probably outdated by the time you're in second grade. It's not the fault of school. School is doing everything exactly right. It's just that our industry changes that fast. And you should be aware of that. So keep up to date. Because if you know, if you know what's happening, you know where you fit in. And there are hundreds of trends, hundreds of things happening in the industry all the time. And if you can see a path, if you can see where things are going, you can jump in just ahead of where the path is. That's where you can get successful. Of course, yes, it's also a coin flip. Of course, there's luck involved. But if you look for those things, it's a lot easier. So, because I need to rush. Um, hey, you need to know what you're doing. Secret. Nobody fucking knows. Nobody knows what they're doing. At some point, we all got a little better. We got a li little bit more expertise. We got a little bit more experience. The honest reality is this industry, as a creative industry, just means that nobody actually knows what they're doing. We got better at mitigating that. We got better at dealing with that. We got better at dealing with the risk of not knowing what we're doing. But if you look at the things that are successful right now, a lot of the things nobody could have predicted, right? Who would have predicted that a game about flinging birds into wooden things would be a hit. Did anybody think that? So I sure didn't. It sounds pretty, pretty weird, actually. I don't think the general audience would like that. Or like matching candy? Nah. Nobody knows what they're doing. And there's, there is a curve for that. There's a, there's a, there's a um, phenomenon known as the Dunning-Kruger curve. Do you know that one? If you don't know that one, it's really, really simple. It kind of goes like this. It's, um, it's a curve that goes like this. It goes up and then back down and then up again, right? And the idea of the curve is it is how much you know versus how much you think you know. And the honest reality is, is when we start something, you know, if you've never played guitar and you grab a guitar for the first time, you know you suck, right? And then you start to play your first song. At some point, you can play a song. You can play a full song. And you're like, good, I can play guitar now. And it's true. But you also think, good, all I need to know to learn every song ever is just do that thing again. And then you go on a forum where somebody tells you you need more technique, and you go like, ah, oh, fuck that. I know what I'm talking about. Like, there's this little point, like right about there, 
really early on where you think you know a lot more than you actually know. And then comes the point where you realize you don't, right? And then everything comes crashing down. Now, the perfect curve will kind of go like diagonal up, right? You know exactly as much as you think you know. And at the first part, the curve is going to be over that. And that's where most of you probably are right now. No offense, but that's where most of you are. And then later on, it's going to come crashing down. And at some point, it's going to go under that diagonal. And then it slowly starts going up. Now, that part, some of you are probably there as well. And that's called imposter syndrome. It's the idea that you are a fraud and everybody is about to find out tomorrow or today. And everybody fucking feels that way. Everybody. The biggest heroes you have in the industry feel that way. Everybody that has been in the industry for a reasonable, of time, for a reasonable amount of time that has experience feels like a fraud. Because there is no objective measurement of how good you are in the industry. It's just, you look at it, you look at all the things you've achieved, and you're like, wow, I've got lucky a lot of times. I hope this keeps going. That would be great. Because if this fucks up, everybody's going to figure out that I don't know what I'm talking about. And I feel like that. I get on the stage here, and I'm like, why the hell are people listening to me? What is happening? But people keep inviting me, so I must be doing something right during my talks. But I have to rationalize that. I have to like take a step back and be like, okay. It's good. If you ever feel that way, don't worry. Everybody else does. Nobody wants to talk about that because we all feel that everybody will be like, I don't feel that way. Are you a fraud? Why do you feel that way? But everybody feels that way. No worries. So a mistake I made is uh, I used to believe assumptions are bad. Right? That's what we get taught. Assumptions are bad. Uh, the good news is assumptions are bad. So I was right. Um, the bad news is assumptions can also be good. I didn't quite realize that. Um, in fact, a large part of our job is assumptions. It's like, I have, a, I have a problem, a question, I don't know something. Let's make a bunch of assumptions of what the right answers might be and then verify and test them. I'd never thought of it like that until I had a discussion with somebody I respect a lot. They said, man, assumptions are terrible. And they're like, no, hell no. Like, what the fuck do you mean? And then it turned out that I was on the first part of the curve and not the second part of the curve, like I thought I was. Uh, but that's the way that curve works, so I guess that's supposed to happen. Um, but I thought game gameplay design was harder than UI design, and I was wrong, apparently. Um, I thought that game development would be fun. It's only right sometimes. I thought uh, having an idea was the hard part of game development. Turns out having ideas is really, really simple. Um, I thought that good games were only made by good developers. That turns out to not be true. Like bad developers make great games sometimes. I used to think that bad games only got made by bad developers. That's also not true. And I look at I used to look at failures and think like I would have done that way better. Fuck no, I wouldn't. Holy shit. Some train wrecks of a project were made by very talented people but everything just kind of turned didn't work out they were a bit too late like creativity is stooled on on assumption and blind faith jumps and then verifying whether those things are right a lot of it is based on gut feelings and then testing you just accept that right assumptions are bad assumptions are good nothing is as black and white nothing is as absolute as you'd like to think now the final thing because I have a panicking person holding up a sign with minus seven minutes, um, <laughs> is give honest feedback. Honest feedback. Like, when you did your pitch before, that was kind of mean of me to give the feedback the way I did. But it was also the best feedback I could have possibly given. I couldn't do better than that. I'm sorry. Um, but give honest feedback, right? So uh, there's four types of feedback, OK? There's a good game. You say it's good. That's fine, right? Then you've got, it's a good game, and you say it's bad. Now you're kind of an asshole, but sure, whatever, right? Worst, they'll try and make it better. It's a bad game, and you say it's bad. Now that's good, because now they can improve it. The final one, it's a bad game, and you say it's good. 
Now you're the worst type of asshole that could possibly exist in this industry, right? Because you're literally betting other people's work, their efforts, on the fact that they can figure it out because you want to save their feelings, right? Because they're friends. Because I don't want to be that harsh. Like, they probably know this. That seems obvious. Don't. When somebody asks you for feedback, give them feedback. If somebody doesn't ask you for feedback, ask if they want feedback. Okay? Don't just start giving feedback to people. Just ask, hey, I have some thoughts about the game. Would you like to hear them? And if they say yes, fucking just carpet bomb the shit out of it. Just fucking go for it. Destroy it. Like, leave nothing in one piece. Just honest feedback. Fucking go for it. Anything. Anything that you don't like. Anything that feels awkward or weird or strange. Anything that feels wrong. Anything that you don't like. Just go. And don't hold back. If that's too much for them, they'll tell you. If they're like, oh, jeez, no, I just wanted you to tell me that it was a good game. They'll be like, oh, sorry, it's not. But, you know, ask people first for feedback, though. That's a mistake a lot of people make where they see a game and go like, oh, yeah, no, this is awful. Just be like, hey, listen, I have some thoughts. Can I talk about that? They say, yes, fucking go for it. Okay. Uh, does anybody have, like, for, like, let's, let's do a fun exercise. Who has feedback for this talk? For this talk right now. Give me some, yeah, go. Yeah, it's really long. Any, anybody else? What? Thank you. Uh, it's loud. Yeah, I don't know who the audio. Perfect. You don't repeat people's questions? Yeah. I don't give a shit. Good, good. Slides are, shit. slides are shit. Why are they shit though? That's not good feedback. Why are they shit? They don't do anything. No, slides are like it's what they do. So. <laughs> so the other thing is you don't have to defend against feedback. He said I should swear less. I don't give a shit, right? It's good feed. It's good feedback, though. It's good feedback. He's right. I do swear a lot. That it's kind of what. Oh, slur. Yeah, it's 9 fucking a.m. in the morning. Jesus Christ. Um, but you're right. I should also swear less. But also, I don't give a shit, right? Um, you don't have to take all feedback. One of the parts of our job is to take feedback, as much feedback as possible, and then figure out what to do with it, right? So one of the things I learned from this one is at 9 a.m. in the morning, talks are hard. And if somebody tells me that I can do an opening keynote, the day after a flight from Portland to here, from the other side of the United States to here, I should probably ask them to do a later talk. That's learning from failure. Don't try to avoid being wrong. Be wrong. Be wrong as often as possible. The trick is not to try and be wrong less frequently. The trick is to try to be wrong for a lower amount of time. So be wrong. Just be wrong, but learn to recognize it. Then when you learn to recognize when you're wrong, when you're wrong, fix it. Don't spend, don't, don't try to be wrong less often. Try to be, whoa, try to be wrong for less time. Okay. I would love to do a Q&A, but I think she would murder me. So uh, if you have any questions, if there's anything you want to ask me, anything you want to talk about, I'm going to be around here somewhere. And the big dude, the beer, scraggly hair, red shirt today. Uh, just find me, punch me, give me a question, go listen to his talk. Thank you so much.